Is someone manipulating the fabric of reality? Have attempts to mass quantum events from our universe's timeline gotten out of hand? Are the massive data monitoring centers around the world actually tracking changes in the temporal framework of reality? More to the point, have you ever thought a famous person was dead only to hear of them dying again? It's called the Mandela Effect. Stay tuned as we explore the profound implications of this bizarre form of deja vu. First, a few housekeeping items. We were defunded by Google six years ago, long before it was fashionable. Uh, then PayPal froze our account for reasons that have yet to be clear. Uh, everything we produce, the blog, the videos, the Twitter feed, are our labor of love. Uh, if you enjoy what we do and would like more, please visit our Patreon page and show us some love. You can also visit our blog site and use the QR code in the right column to drop us some Bitcoin. All the links are included in the description below. You can also help us expand by subscribing, liking, and sharing our, our content with your circles of influence. And who knows, given today's topic, you may soon be able to do this retroactively to the beginning of time. A note about the audio. We tried a new recording process that left the audio a bit hammered. We'll upload the video again when we get all the sweetening done. Dr. Joseph P. Farrell holds a PhD in patristics from the University of Oxford and has written over two dozen books that span at least the past three million years of human history. His research is impeccable and his sources are always thoroughly referenced making his work stand out in a crowded field of alternative history. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Farrell for a mind-blowing look into the Mandela Effect. Joseph, welcome back to Radio Farside. It's always a pleasure to have you join us. Thanks for having me back, Bernard. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, it's been a while since we talked. It's been about a little over a year, I think, when when we last uh, discussed. Uh, oh gosh, what was the topic? Oh, the Trinity, the origin of the Trinity, mm -hmm. and uh, that's turned out to be a very popular video. And you, I get a lot of requests from listeners uh, asking me to to bring you back on. You're one of those people that everybody loves to listen to about the the strange and unusual. <laughs> Uh, who was it? Uh, George Ann Hughes used to say, uh, strange stuff. Yep, strange stuff. Mm -mm. High octane speculation is, is what I call it on my, on my website. Yes, and, and some of the stuff you get into is really interesting. And, and today there's a topic that I really haven't heard you talk much about, at least openly. Uh, and in fact, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of, um, shall we say, intelligent information on the topic of the Mandela effect right. and um, I, I really wanted to talk to you about it we initially talked about a year ago privately uh, about an experience I had and, and turns mm -hmm. out that you've had several yourself um, mm -hmm. but let's start by by having you uh, give us what you think is a good definition for the Mandela effect well, I think the Mandela Effect can be explained as a deliberate case of uh, data obfuscation. And, and the reason I say that is, is we'll get back to, to what it is. It's more important, I think, to, to get out of the picture right up front what the Mandela Effect is not. Mm. Uh, what it is not are changes in the spellings of Berenstein Bears or labels on different products or things of this nature because if you're familiar with editing or marketing or advertising, this stuff goes on all the time. Um, you know, where they repackage something and try to remarket it for a particular audience or a select group. 
what the Mandela effect is are, and it usually seems to center around the deaths or incidents affecting famous people. Uh, and, and that's how I remember it. And, and that's how I would qualify it is, is people remembering the deaths of people that turn up not to be dead. Uh, and that's, that's, and of course it was named after Nelson Mandela because people remember hearing reports of him having died, I think back in the, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s. And it turns out he's alive. Well, and didn't die until 2013, I believe, right? Right, right. In exactly. fact, when, when we first talked, you mentioned that to me. You said, uh, well, when do you think Nelson Mandela died? And I said, well, it seems like it was the late 90s. Yep, and and yep. you mentioned oh, it was 2013, and I was shocked. I I couldn't believe that. Yeah, I remember him having died in the 1990s. I'll tell you what did it for me. And for years, I thought I I was nuts, uh, you know, because I have a fairly good memory, um, and I remember very vividly in the 1990s hearing about the death of the famous White House uh, reporter Helen Thomas. Mm-hmm. And I remember it in, in such detail that I don't think my memory is mistaken. I remember hearing a news report I, at the time I was working and at home, and I had my television kind of on in the background, and I remember hearing a story about Helen Thomas dying. Uh, President Clinton gave a few nice words about her and so on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that kind of registered in the back of my mind. I thought, well, oh, no, that's too bad. And then come to find out years later that, no, she hadn't died at all. (laughs) Yeah, she died again. She died again. (laughs) And, you know, this... For years, I thought, well, gee, did I did I not hear that news report? Was I mistaken? Was it, you know, was it something that my mind confabulated? Well... Years later, it turned out a friend of mine remembers hearing about Kirk Douglas having died. Mm. And I, you know, we got to talking about this, and lo and behold, I, yeah, I kind of remembered the same thing. Well, lo and behold, Kirk Douglas didn't die. And is still alive now. And still alive now. And, you know, in Kirk Douglas's case, it, it got to the point that, again, my memory is either playing tricks on me or there's something going on. Uh, I remember um, listening to Mike Douglas, I think it was on The Tonight Show or one of those late night talk shows, Mm -hmm. talking about his famous father and, you know, his death. And then all of a sudden he turns up alive. (laughs) Well, and and that was my memory as well. I I distinctly remember an interview with Michael Douglas uh, talking about his father's career and and doing it in retrospective after, after his death. And, and come to find out he's still alive was was a bit uh, off-putting. It, it just makes you do a double or triple take, really. Yes, yes. And this, you know, this is happening to more and more people. And it was at the point, I think it was really at the point that my friend and I talked about Kurt Douglas, and then he remembers uh, Richard Chamberlain as well, as, you know, the old Dr. Kildare is having died. And uh, I said, really? I said, I hadn't heard that one, but, you know, nothing would surprise me. So, you know, it was largely when I talked to my friend about this that I began to pay attention to this thing because, you know, he's uh, a bright guy, very intelligent, and, again, has a very good memory. So, you know, and then you and I talked, and I thought, well, that settles it, you know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's something going on here, and it's more than meets the eye. Well, and what precipitated this conversation was uh, I sent an email to you asking about uh, your memories of Larry Flint. Uh, yes. Mentioning that I had a, a Mandela effect uh, experience, in that, and in, in some background in in court in university, my degree is in communication, so Flint versus Falwell was a was a major legal decision that that uh, right. uh, we had to learn, and I did, even did a paper on him years and years ago. So I, I've kind of followed his life, and and I was convinced he had died maybe three, four, five years ago, and then recently there was an article he had issued a, a ten million dollar reward for information leading to the uh, impeachment of Donald Trump, 
and and I nearly fell out of my chair. Right, right. And like you, I kind of I vaguely remember, although it it doesn't come with the detail that uh, it did with with uh, Helen Thomas or, or Kurt Douglas. Uh, but I vaguely remember the same thing. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I bump into more and more people, particularly on my website. I'm sure you have similar phenomenon. More and more people that have similar incidents to recount, mm-hmm. uh, where they've heard of the death of, of famous people that turn up alive. And to me, right there, Bernard, this suggests that there is a pattern, and it's this this uh, playing around with the deaths of famous people that don't turn up dead. Um, that convinces me that there's something going on here. And, <coughs> pardon me, as far as I can tell, or the way I view it now, is I think we're looking at four possibilities, and, and each of these possibilities increase in terms of their implications and seriousness. When you look at the standard explanations given for the so-called Mandela effect, it's simply that people are misremembering things. Mm -hmm. And the problem here is, again, well, then why are so many people misremembering things in a specific way? Why do you have people remembering the death of Kirk Douglas when he's not dead? Why do you have people remembering the death of, of Richard Chamberlain when he's not dead? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and on, on, on and on this goes. Is this some sort of mass psychosis, in other words? And again, if that's the case, then what's bringing it on? <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? yes. So that's that's the first theory out there, and I I really... I, I don't discount it, you know. We all have our memory lapses. We all get confused and kind of tangle things. But the fact that so many are having it with the same people suggests, first of all, at, at kind of a second level, that perhaps there is some, um, I, I don't know what you'd call it, perhaps there's some sort of uh, group or, or mass mind manipulation going on. Mm-hmm. And if you look at what's happening, it appears to be happening in conjunction with specific people, famous people, right. in in specific areas. In other words, I think it I think it would be possible to manipulate uh, the data stream simply by putting out false stories in a particular region, and then tracking and seeing what happens. Uh, by way of, of learning the ways of information flow and so on. I think that's one possibility we might be looking at here mm-hmm. in terms of this mind manipulation uh, hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that actually, that, uh, that doesn't seem all that uh, implausible since, well, controlling people's thoughts and, and uh, uh, perception seems to be uh, the, the major focus of mass media now. Right, um, exactly. So exactly. That, that doesn't seem implausible that the stories would be planted to make people think uh, that something had happened that did not or, or vice versa. But, uh, I mean, I, I have the, the – my experience with B.B. King was that we – I was with a group of people. We were stagehands years ago and had worked many times with B.B. King and mm-hmm. had very specific experiences with him. Uh, so when he died, at least to to our perception in 2005, uh, we we noted uh, the the event, and right. then come to find out he died in May of 2015, uh, ten years yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, and in that case, again, it's not just you; it's it's a group of witnesses, and and you had very specific detailed uh, memories surrounding the first alleged death, and mm-hmm. this. This is, to me, another possible clue as to what we're dealing with, which kind of brings me to to the uh, third layer, or the third hypothesis, that we're looking at some sort of deliberate data obfuscation, a kind of a deliberate epistemological warfare. Wow. Uh, to, yeah, to, to unhinge the ability of people to process information and arrive at conclusions because really what you're doing is you're you're throwing into question every 
news source. And when you throw into question every news source, what you're really doing is you're creating a, a state of paralysis. People don't know what to do, don't know what to think. And, you know, that's very disturbing in and of itself because if you, if you are deliberately targeting certain regions with false stories of, you know, famous people's deaths, mm -hmm. what you're also doing, and this, <laughs> this is going to sound so completely harebrained, Bernard, but this really is, this fourth thing that I'm about to mention is for me what I think the, the whole Mandela effect may really be about. Because in effect, what you're doing is you're creating a false timeline. You're creating a false history. You're creating a false memory. And you're doing so in certain targeted select groups of people. Mm. Now, the real question is, why would you want to create different timelines? Why have some people believing that person X is dead and other people, you know, no, they didn't hear that story. Person X is still alive. And you see this this going on in, in conjunction with, with the Mandela effect uh, in a major way. So there's something, there's another level, in other words, that is beyond even what I'm suggesting in terms of, of an epistemological warfare, mm. and, and that's physics. Because if you look at the, the evolution of modern physics, particularly with quantum mechanics, it was really quantum mechanics that enshrined the observer squarely in the middle of, of physics. And that threw everybody for a loop. Uh, because the uncertainty principle, let's just recall for people what this is. The uncertainty principle was, was, uh, codified by, uh, Heisenberg. The German right. physicist Werner Heisenberg. And basically it states that you cannot measure the position of an electron at the same time as you me measure its momentum. Mm -hmm. In other words, those are conjugate attributes and you have to select which one you're going to measure. Well, what this means in effect is that prior to the performance of any measurement in quantum mechanics, the observer has already determined to a certain extent the outcome by, by determining what it is they're going to look for. Mm -hmm. And by determining what it is they're going to look for, they determine what it is they're going to find. So, you know, the problem there has always been, well, is that the case then on the macro level? Could we, could we conceivably have a, a power of, of group observers to influence or alter physical reality simply on the basis of observation at the macro level. Wow. Yeah, that's that's kind of creepy and scary. Well, you know, there's there's been a number of scientists, Dr. William Tiller uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles, I think, that's done a number of experiments with um, the idea of conscious intention altering the material performance of animate and inanimate material. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done a number of fascinating experiments in this regard, and in point of fact, he's been able to document that this, in fact, does have a macro effect. So I suspect if you're looking at the Mandela effect, if you want to run a, a cosmic, um, let's say if you want to run a cosmic physics experiment, to determine if there are actual physical results from changed observation, then what would you do? Well, you do precisely what this Mandela effect is. You would be planting stories where certain groups of people are remembering one timeline and other groups are not to see if there's any corresponding physical result. Yeah, that's kind of scary um, when you stop and think about it. Because it's what you're, yeah. it's, it's horrifying, yeah, because it's a cosmological and ultimately nihilistic game that you're playing on, you know, on a cosmological scale. Mm -hmm. So what could possibly happen as a result of this is you get two different timelines operating in the same uh, physical locale, so to speak. 
and therefore, you know, let's let's really crawl way out onto the end of the twig here, and mm-hmm. and really you know, really speculate beyond any evidence uh, out there. If that's the case, then what you're doing is you're playing around with the multiverse hypothesis of quantum mechanics in a very direct way. Uh, the multiverse hypothesis being that there's a universe, really, that actualizes every observer choice ever made. Mm-hmm. So, in other words, you know, somewhere out there, there's a universe where Adolf Hitler wins World War II, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, so, what you're really doing is you're creating a multitude of timelines in more or less the same universe running concurrently. So, they start to bleed over with each other. Which brings me to to the back to the Mandela effect. By pla- planting some of these stories, it could be the case that these people really did die in some timeline or another, and we're getting little hints of it here. And that means, of course, that you've created uh, common surfaces between this universe and, and whatever other universe that these other alternative realities are part of. And again. Once you've let the cat out of the bag, how do you stop it? Good Lord. In, uh, well, in a sense, I guess uh, what you're saying is that we're some, part of some kind of massive Schrodinger's cat uh, experiment. Bingo. Bingo. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Bingo. Exactly. I think, you know, if you were setting up an experiment like this, Bernard, what would you do? Well, first of all, you'd have to, you would have to set it up in such a way that the stories and results are public. So in other words, you, you'd you have to use uh, mass media, number one. Right. Number two, you would have to have massive data tracking capability. In other words, you would have to be running what I call data correlation experiments. Uh, if, if XYZ story is released, what is the effect on human behavior in ABC? So, in other words, by running these stories, uh, you're also tracking a multitude of other things apparently unrelated to see if there's been any modification of behavior. And, of course, you'd have to have massive computing power to to be able to do that. But, again, I think this is precisely uh, what may be going on uh, with all of this, that this is some sort of, as you very aptly put it, Schrodinger's cat experiment. Wow. Does it? Well, that... I mean, that would certainly give impetus for things like the the big uh, NSA server farm in uh, where yep. was it, Utah, and the uh, GCHQ in, in the UK, and yep. uh, the CERN data farm uh, in Switzerland. Oh, yes, that's a big part of it. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. Well, it, it, I mean... It, this whole thing about terrorism then is just is just an excuse to be able to fund uh, these massive data farms, which are, are in effect tracking information through the, as you say, through the multiverse, and trying right. to figure out what people's reactions are. This is wow. <laughs> yeah, and you know there, the consequence of this is very disturbing to me. And again, you know, I want to emphasize that this is extraordinarily high octane speculation mm-hmm. you know there there is uh there's no direct evidence for this but by the same token the evidence at least supports the hypothesis that this may be in fact what's being done but let's assume for the sake of argument here that this schrodinger's cat experiment is you know on a cosmic scale is in fact what's taking place well if if it is then one of the consequences that, to my mind, seems to be implicated in in the hypothesis is that you would have, as a result of this, you would have a beginning breakdown in some of the fundamental constants of physics. Now, you know, we know the constants of physics are are really not constant. They're, They're averages of measurements taken. Right. But, uh, you know, one of the things that will happen is that some of these fundamentals will begin to start breaking down in weird ways. Um, the, the universe that we know, so to speak, will start to become porous, uh, and, and leach into other so-called universes. Again, you know, taking the multiverse hypothesis as, as true for the sake of our 
so yeah, this this could be one of the things that starts to to happen as a result of this. And you know, uh, Nexus Magazine over the years has has run a number of articles about some very very strange incidents of people that appear to be from somewhere else. Uh, you know, on my website I even have a, a paper in the members area about parallel universe people, a lady in Spain, in Barcelona, uh, wakes up one day, goes to work, and reports to her normal department, and all of a sudden she realizes, no, she's not in, she's not in the right department. She recognizes none of the people right. that supposedly work there, and in addition, her boyfriend is missing, you know. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she's, you know, she's not crazy or anything, but she's, she's, just not from there, you know. Uh, another case in Japan uh, yeah. that Nexus that Nexus reported that was very, very weird to me. Uh, that again makes me think that this is all kind of somehow related to our Mandela effect, Schrodinger's cat experiment. Was this gentleman shows up at Japanese customs in Tokyo, having just arrived on a flight? He presents credentials to the customs officials from a country in Europe that doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. I don't know if you've heard of this story. I know it very well, yeah. Yeah, presents credentials that from a country that doesn't exist, so the customs officials, you know, they, they don't know what to do, so they get him a motel room while they try and figure out what to do, and they, you know, put, put him under guard, and, and this motel room's on the fifth floor. Well, they open it up the next day, and the guy's completely gone. He's just not there. Right. So, you know, there there may be something happening here that that, uh, that this experiment may have gotten out of control and uh, that they may not even really know now how to, how to control the damage that they've done. Put the cat back in the bag, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put, yeah, put Schrodinger's cat back in the box. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that's that's the bad thing about this is all my intuition says that if if indeed this crazy wild hypothesis is in fact what's going on, well, my intuition is that once you start the process, it's it's going to be very very difficult to reverse it. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me, Bernard, that in in entertaining this hypothesis, which I've been kind of entertaining for a number of years. Um, What's interesting to me is in the last, I'd say, four to five years, we see increasing stories from reputable uh, scientific websites like phys.org and Science News and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. where scientists in the laboratory have been ex experimenting with placing little temporal bubbles around micro-events. In other words, they, they remove certain events from the time stream at a micro level. And, you know, my, my question is, well, why would they be wanting to do that, to, you know, unless there, there is something that's uh, come to their attention that may be fundamentally wrong? So I think even those experiments are little clues that something is up. If you can engineer the fabric of space-time on the laboratory bench and remove certain events from the time stream, well, that's exactly with Mandela effect because you, you are deliberately tinkering with the timeline with a certain group's historical memory and that's have consequences on a macro level that's, that's in effect godlike power that's, that's astounding it is yes it is it is and it <coughs> it's it's so uh, disturbing because the implications of this one consciousness is a much more uh, powerful thing than the materialistic paradigm of, of uh, science will admit, you know, popular science. And the other thing that it suggests is that these data correlation experiments, this massive surveillance uh, uh, that you've indicated, is a part of this. And I think it is. Uh, you know, if, uh, for a number of reasons, I think the war on terror is really uh, a, a spin story put out for for several different things that they don't want to talk about. Um, that's, yeah, that's what occurs to me. Yeah, well, not the least of which is precisely to establish these massive databases and and do data correlation 
uh, experiments. You know, when CERN is turned on, does the magnetosphere of the northern hemisphere dip? Does it cause reaction in the sun? Does it re cause reaction in stock market or commodities market behavior and so on? So this would be the same sort of uh, type of experiment that we're talking about, data correlation between releasing a false story and then uh, seeing what happens with it. Are, are you aware of anybody in the public sphere that has correlated uh, CERN's operations with, with physical events? Yes, there are a number of people on the Internet that have tracked uh, alleged changes in the structure of the magnetosphere when the Hadron Collider is turned on. I don't know ex how accurate these sites are, hmm. but, but to me it stands to reason that if you have those extraordinarily powerful magnetic fields which you know are several times stronger than the local magnetic field of the earth right that it's going to have you know it's going to have a planetary resonance effect and because the magnetosphere is, is coupled with that of the sun it might even have resonance effects in in our you know in our own star so yeah there's all sorts of ways you can you can approach this thing um and I, you know, I hate to say it, Bernard, but I get the feeling that this Mandela effect, if you look at it, really begins to become operative in, in the 1990s, the late 1990s, and has continued more or less since. When precisely you have these big particle accelerators like the Hadron Collider coming online. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there may be a correlation there that we're unaware of. Um, you know, it's, again, I'm crawling way out onto the twig of speculation there, but uh, that's that's a suspicion I have, and, you know, uh, I, I claim the academic right to be wrong. Yeah, when I voice the, when I voice the suspicion. Well, you, I mean, you, you have to start with a theoretical... Uh Concept that that you set out to prove that's that's part of the process, um, right? And and what what you're talking about puts me in mind too. Uh, over the past few years, the the uh, magnetic pole swap of the Earth uh, yep. seems to be accelerating. the The north and south poles are moving towards uh, Indonesia. By the way, uh, yeah, and uh, that you know this is not unusual. It's happened many many times over the over the eons, but uh, uh, that it's accelerating uh, in, in relation to about the time when things like CERN and, and other uh, machines like that have come online is, is rather interesting. It's interesting and it's disturbing because, again, you know, going back to the first uh, hypothesis that this is sort of some sort of uh, mass memory problem, mm. perhaps, perhaps the result of uh, mass application of, of mind manipulation technologies. Well, the human brain is, of course, an electromagnetic uh, structure, a very complicated, complex one, but it is nonetheless electromagnetic in nature. So if you, if you change the field in which it operates, it's bound to have some sort of effect on human thought processes and memory. And this, again, could be what's going on here with a little deliberate tickling, um, you know, by the use of, of mind control technologies. So there's any number of ways to look at this. But here's the problem. If you, if you posit that some of this Mandela effect is the result of the use of mind manipulation technologies, then it takes us four square back to the fourth hypothesis that we're in sort of some sort of Schrodinger's cat experiment because now you're in you're inducing this not only by deliberately planting false stories but you you are adding to this a layer of mind manipulation technology for the express purpose of manipulating consciousness for the express purpose of manipulating cosmic reality and and timelines wow. so this yeah wow you know and uh, if you read some of the mind control literature out there, Bernard, you, you discover that this is not entirely uh, uh, impossible because there are so many strange stories of people 
having had such strange effects happen to them that, that claim that they were mind control victims, mm -hmm. uh, false memories and, and things of this sort. So again, you've got the you've got the Mandela effect template even in that literature. Could uh, would it be would it be unusual to say that maybe this is kind of an MK Ultra thing on a mass scale? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it is. Once you once you once you admit that at least at the second level they may be resorting to some sort of epistemological warfare, well yeah, then you are talking about mind manipulation in the form of social engineering on a massive scale. So yeah, you know, I I see no difficulty with that. I've never bought the idea that you know the CIA suddenly abandoned MK Ultra just because right. Senator Senator Church held his committee. You know, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We just change the name of it and keep going. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, okay. Now to say that this is happening means that there must be a purpose. There, there's some goal in mind. And, and do you have any speculation on what that goal may be? What are they after? Well, I. I think what they're after is precisely to find out, number one, if there is a an observer effect on a macro cosmological, if you will, scale. Mm. And if so, to learn what the laws of that effect are and to acquire that power. So in other words, they want that godlike power. But, but they want to be able to understand it and uh, be able to manipulate it for whatever purposes they want to, to do. Uh, so part of this, I suspect, is that they are attempting to learn these laws of how this phenomenon operates uh, in order to be able to do that. So that's why you have all of these recurrent stories of Oh, this person died. Well, no, they didn't, and so on and so forth. They're they're trying to learn something, and the only way to do this is by running these what I what I'm calling data correlation experiments. So yeah, this this I think is their goal is to acquire that power. Wow. Well, the, interestingly, this brings up something. I don't know if you're familiar with a guy named Ben Davidson. He runs a, a site called Suspicious Observers. Um, and he's one of the most interesting uh, solar and, and weather uh, uh, weather guys out there. His research is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, he's noted something called the, the earth-facing quiet effect on the sun, where there seems to be a whole lot of activity whenever uh, sunspots rotate out of sight, of uh, direct line of sight of the earth. But then as soon as they come into, into line of sight of the Earth, all of a sudden they get quiet. And there hasn't been a whole lot of activity directly uh, aimed at the Earth for a long time. Uh, many years, in fact, since 2011, I think. Wow. Uh, other than, a couple, you know, recently we had a couple of X flares, uh, which were highly unusual uh, given the, the past few years. But his, he actually speculated with somebody. He was doing an interview, and he said, um, it's possible that we collectively, or at least a group of people, are actually affecting solar activity by thinking about it. Yeah, that, again, you know, that takes me back to the work of, of uh, Dr. Tiller. Mm. Uh, I have a webinar on, in the members area on my website about his work. Uh, which is very interesting because he demonstrated that by conscious intention you can actually change the gestation period of fruit flies. You can change the, the population of fruit flies. You can change the uh, field of information, so to speak, around inanimate objects and, and actually change the pH balance in acidity in, in certain uh, chemicals simply by thinking about it. And it's, it's very interesting, I think you'll appreciate this, it's very interesting that in his experiments what he had was, number one, he had a group of people doing this. And I've maintained for years in connection with my uh, topological metaphor of the medium idea that a group observer is going to have a much more pronounced effect than an individual oh, will. Sure. But um, 
what is very interesting is that he actually had these people read a written out intention, a specific intention to raise or lower, in other words, to raise or lower the pH uh, in certain chemicals or so on and so forth. In other words, he actually formally specified exactly what the intention was. Well, you know, uh, we're both trained in, in classical sacramental theology, and in, in classical sacramental theology, you have to have the proper intention for the sacrament to work. Well, what's the intention? Well, the intention is specified by the formula used in the liturgy itself. So, in other words, you know, certain specific words must be present uh, in order for, for sacramental intention to be, uh, to be there. And again, you find this happening in William Tiller in a very specific way. So could the sun be the result? Possibly. Um, I think it's interesting that, that you mentioned, you know, I'm not familiar with this guy's website, but I think it's interesting that he's noted these correlations between the earth uh, facing the sun and the sunspots facing away from the earth. And again, there's another correlation here that this may, this, it is all happening in a period when the Hadrian Collider has become operative. Mm -hmm. So, again, we might be looking not only at conscious resonance effects, we might be looking at magnetic resonance effects and so on. And again, you're going to study all of that uh, through data correlation experiments, uh, which are going to be kept very, very classified and very secret. In other words, I've always maintained that CERN has another level of secrecy to it, and and the particle physics that they claim they're doing is the public level. Um, right. It's it's the secret level that concerns me. Well, uh, uh, we've even traded emails a while back about uh, a guy named Goro Adachi uh, had yes. a uh, theory that the the design of CERN has certain uh, mathematical relationships. Uh, that that seem rather unusual, other than to have a specific effect. Uh, right. Yes. There's like an inner ring yeah, and whole, an outer ring. Yeah. Whole... Go ahead. Yeah. The um, the design of the structure always struck me as peculiar because you have, in my opinion, you have the possibility for some massive. Uh, dynamic torsion effects with the way that the thing is laid out, mm -hmm. and you know, um, again, you won't find you won't find any mainstream scientist saying this or anything like that. So people have to take that with a grain of salt. But uh, simply the fact that you have the the proton synchrotron accelerator, which is the final circular accelerator that injects the, the stream of particles into the Hadron Collider, which is the la much larger circular accelerator. Well, the proton-synchrotron accelerator, if you were to bring it down to the same level as the Hadron Collider, would actually be sitting on the edge of it. So in other words, it's canted off the axis of rotation of, of the Hadron Collider. And... You know, that to me suggests, given the strong magnetic fields involved with both of those uh, circular accelerators, mm -hmm. suggests the possibility that you'd have a precessional uh, phenomenon that could be deliberately in induced into the Hadron Collider through the manipulation of the magnetic fields. And, of course, once you've said that, you're talking about torsion, uh, dynamic torsion of, of a very pronounced nature. So, yeah, there's all sorts of things that, you know, you can speculate here, but um, I would not be a bit surprised since we're talking about all of this high-octane speculation. I would not be a bit surprised to discover that there is some sort of consciousness component to what's going on at CERN that is very, very carefully hidden. Yeah, the, the, it's, it's rather bizarre. I mean, you get almost no news out of that place at all. Uh, yeah. they, they've claimed at least twice to have discovered the Higgs boson, which was the ostensibly the reason for building it. Uh, right. But the, the discovery was later falsified or, or at least withdrawn. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's really bizarre that you would think a multi-billion dollar machine the size of a couple of countries um, would, would be producing a lot of data, a lot of information that, that just doesn't seem to be there. 
Well, it is it is producing a lot of data. Um, I, I wrote about this whole thing in in my book called The Third Way. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I, I did read that one. I dedicated a whole chapter uh, to CERN in that book because if you look at the way CERN is set up, Bernard, number one, it's a sovereign entity, and most people don't know that. Um, when there were lawsuits taken out against uh, letting the thing start up in, in Germany and in, in the United States, the courts, of course, dismissed the lawsuit because they had no jurisdiction over it. Uh, and then this, as a result of those lawsuits, it came out that CERN is actually a sovereign entity. It's kind of the particle physics equivalent of the Bank of International Settlements. I, I was <laughs> just going to say, yeah, or the Vatican, yeah. for that matter. Or the Vatican, yeah. You know, it's it's its own thing, folks. And uh, the as a sovereign entity, it it answers to the the countries that you know give money to it, and of course, the biggest donor to money of money to CERN is Germany. So think of it as kind of an international, sovereign German thing, uh, whatever that means. But the way CERN is set up is, by the nature of the case, they had to come up with computer algorithms that would sort the data, because, of course, it's generating billions of, of reactions in a second. So, you know, the scientists can't sort through all this, so what they did was they generated computer algorithms that would pull data for the scientists to look at and then, you know, shelve the rest. Mm. And it's it's that that very phenomenon that makes me think there's a second level to this because if you can pull data to shiv to the to the particle physicists to look at, you can also induce algorithms to pull data of any anomalous nature, in other words, data that doesn't fit the predictions of the standard model of quantum mechanics, data that that might indicate that you're getting torsion reactions and so on and so forth, or even data correlation between CERN's activity and the activity of, of humans in certain particular areas like markets and so on. Well, you could you could have a second secret layer of algorithm in all of that data collection that would then pull that data and shunt it to secret committees of scientists to look at. Uh, there's, in fact, there's no doubt in my mind that this is probably what's going on because, as you say, the particle physics aspect of this thing, you know, you're building a multi-billion dollar machine to test the standard model, and I remember the the, the uh, ruckus over the discovery, and then the retraction, and then the subsequent rediscovery yeah, yeah. Of, of the Higgs boson. Well, the problem with CERN is, you know, the only way you can verify the results is either to run the same experiment at CERN, which is, you know, a conflict of interest, or you've got to build your own accelerator and challenge or test the data for yourself. And mm -hmm. notably, the Chinese are doing this. They want to build their own much bigger version of CERN. Uh, and I suspect that the reasons that the Chinese are doing this is, you know, they're not fools. Uh -huh. uh, they, they can look at the same data and see the same kind of song and dance and probably have their own suspicions about what's going on. So they've decided, well, we're going to look into this on our own. <coughs> and part of that is I suspect that they too may be entertaining the idea that there's more levels to CERN than meet the eye. Oh, I, I think that would be obvious. And, and of course, what you're saying is that, that the algorithms are, are looking, one, for patterns at one end of the extreme. And right. then they're looking for, for things that, that blatantly violate those patterns at right. the other extreme. Right. And right. I guess... Uh, Probably you'd want to correlate that to um, what people are saying and thinking and doing on a mass scale, which would be the the surveillance system. Right. You're, you're checking phone calls and email and text messages and, and coordinating, uh, uh, collating everything against a certain timeline. Wow, this is yeah. When you start thinking about this, it's just mind blowing. 
Yeah, and, and again, I think this is all related to Mandela effect because if you are getting let, let's let's back up here and look at CERN for a moment and to really to really lock this down. In uh, 1935, there was a Hungarian Jewish electrical engineer by the name of Gabriel Krohn. Mm -hmm. And you've heard me talk about him before. Gabriel Krohn wrote a paper that won him the Montefiore Prize at the University of Liège in Belgium. And in the paper, what Krohn essentially stated was that certain transient phenomena that electrical engineers encounter in large networked electrical systems, particularly rotating ones, <laughs> mm -hmm. were could could be explained by the higher dimensional mathematics that were floating around in the unified field theories of the time. Mm -hmm. And he basically ends up, if you read Crohn's various papers and, and books and so on, Basically, Crohn's approach to electrical engineering is that every electrical circuit, no matter how simple or how complex, like CERN, is essentially a hyperdimensional machine. The reason why is that it requires mathematics in more than three spatial dimensions to describe any electrical circuit. <laughs> okay? Wow. So right there he's telling you, if you if you really stop and think about it, right there he's telling you that CERN is a hyperdimensional machine. Now if that's the case, then it stands to reason that when it's operating, it's going to have hyperdimensional effects. And one of those effects might be precisely what we're talking about. In fact, there's people out there speculating kind of in wild ways that uh, that indeed CERN is, is creating uh, gateways between universes. Well, again, this takes us back to Mandel effect. Because you know we've we've discussed these these strange people that show up in Spain at the wrong place to work and and don't remember any of their their coworkers and strange people from countries that don't exist in Europe showing up in Japan and, you know on and on. Well, and, and even uh, you've speculated this on uh, on this before, but the, uh, the uh, Malaysian Airlines uh, 370. Yep. Still, still has the possibility of going poof. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought that into the mix because you know, uh, in looking at that story and how it's evolved, I'll, I'll, I'll be blunt here. It appears to me that every story that comes out recently that oh, computer modeling has suggested this is the real crash site or that's the real crash site or, or looky, looky, we found this debris way over here in Madagascar mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, um, that there's a certain note of desperation in these stories it appears to me um, that, that they're desperate to explain this thing because thus far there has been no explanation there have been lots of kind of weird conspiracy theories about it right but, you know, I, I came up with the poof explanation. It just disappeared, folks. <laughs> you know, it was a Bermuda Triangle event of some sort. Well, uh, I mean, when you, when you lack any other evidence, that has to be entertained as a possibility. Right, right. And the interesting thing is there, you can, you can read about uh, pilots that have uh, – gone through these vortexes that sometimes appear in very, very strong storms, these mm -hmm. kind of horizontal vortexes, where they'll emerge on the other side with, you know, massive amounts of time missing and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, you know, I don't rule these things out of the picture, but if you are, and again, it takes me back to what I said previously, if you are dealing in the Mandela effect with a kind of Schrodinger's cat uh, experiment on a, on a planetary scale, then it's possible that some of these universes begin to bleed through. In other words, our universe begins to become porous, mm. uh, which is not a good thing, by the way. <laughs> no, I, it doesn't sound comfortable, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not a good thing. Um, but you you get these strange you get these strange things happening uh, as a result of it. And again, you know, just speculating wildly here, it could be that MH370 was was one such thing. 
Uh, I kind of backed off on the poof explanation when they started discovering debris, and I even wrote a blog to that effect when, when the first debris started being discovered. But then a pilot that's a member of my website in Australia contacted me and did an analysis of some of this debris, and his basic conclusion was, no, this couldn't possibly be from, from that aircraft. Well, and, and, so, and don't I remember that at some point they found uh, one of the pilot's seats in the Philippines and then yeah, later found debris, engine debris in Madagascar? Yeah, there, you know, there, there, the Philippine story came out and supposedly was debunked. I think that was about a year and, and a quarter ago. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, supposedly a bit of engine debris and so on. Uh, my problem there, Bernard, goes way back to what I said when George Ann Hughes first interviewed me about MH370. This was about a week after the flight had disappeared. Right. I told her then that, and and you can go listen to this interview, I think it's still online, I told her then that I would be extremely suspicious about any crash site in the Indian Ocean. And she said, well, why is that? And I said, because, number one, the Indian Ocean is very deep, and only a few countries possess the technology to be able to go down that deeply and, and explore for debris. So... I said I'd be very suspicious for that reason, and I said also that, you know, an entire week has gone by. It is entirely possible that debris fields could be salted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, nothing about that story uh, has really been resolved, uh, at least to my satisfaction. So, again, we may be dealing, as you say, with a case of it just went poof, and it may be uh, related in some way to all these other strange phenomena. Yeah, it's uh, in, in going way back to when we started this conversation, you mentioned, mentioned changes in, in uh, physical constants. And mm -hmm. something uh, I've been watching is uh, speculation or, or actual uh, papers on uh, the speed of light changing, yes. uh, Planck's constant changing, yes, or being <laughs> malleable, malleable. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and what else are there? The to think the cosmological other. constant, right, uh, uh, I think, has been one of them that's been up for, for variability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and if my memory serves me and, and correctly here, I seem to recall a paper about the gravitational constants uh, undergoing some slight changes. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, even having uh, variations in gravity on Earth, uh, right. now, a certain amount of that is, is just natural variability, but... Right. Uh, there, there are certain areas that seem to be, uh, what is it, uh, 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 anomalous. They're, they're not fitting yeah. any, any normal model. Right. And, and again, you know, there are local variations in the gravitational acceleration on, on the planet's surface. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Einstein basically, in, in general relativity, relativity, is taking an average, more or less, of, of uh, planetary effects rather than trying to account for local gravitational anomaly. Right. And, and again, that, you know, to a certain extent he had to do that, but then again, that may be a methodological problem in that these effects may be uh, having much more pronounced large-scale effects than we realize. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, all of this, you know, the thing we have to remember is science is, is uh, science is not settled dogma. It's always changing. And uh, in this case, yeah, we're getting little, perhaps, perhaps, and I underscore that word, we're getting little telltale signs that perhaps some of these wild speculations aren't, aren't necessarily so wild. Yeah, that's, uh, I guess the thing we have to be careful about here is, is how much of it is learning new things about things that we used to think were constant. Right. And, and how much of it is, is things changing. Uh, right, in, in exactly. In unusual ways. Exactly. But that, yeah, you know, that I comes think... back to the Mandela effect. I mean, it, it to me, it's it's a a real experience. It's something I've yes. had three times, very very strongly. Uh, and it, it it's just uh, I I can't write it off as a bad memory or anything like that. I, I just can't. 
Well, same here. You know, like I pointed out, I in my case, I thought, well, maybe I just misremembered that mm -hmm. until you know, until I had the conversation with my friend, and then the subsequent ones with you that you you yourself had experienced this, and and the key here for for me was in all three cases there was a level of detail to the experience that suggested that no, this was not something misremembered. Uh, because I remember very specifically, you know, what I what I recall about Helen Thomas, right. uh, and and your case with B.B. King and so on. So I can't write it off. And too many people uh, around around the world are reporting similar things. So there is something going on. Um, the bottom line for me, Bernard, is that I I suspect some of it is very deliberately being done. But I think part of it is now a process that's gotten away from them. Uh, and they, they don't know what to do about it. And this takes me back to MH370, again, with this kind of, uh, to me, this creeping note of hysteria with each new explanation that comes out, you know, that this is really the crash site and this is really what happened and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that they're not willing to discuss is that it just went poof. And incidentally, I'm not the only one that uh, that entertains that theory. George Norrie and uh, the actor Richard Belzer mm -hmm. uh, came out with a book, and I believe it was called Something is Wrong, and they entertained at one point in one of the chapters in that book uh, about MH370 that indeed it just may have gone poof and nobody really knows what happened to it. Yeah, apparently uh, we seem to be looking at a cosmological oops. Yeah, something something is off. Something is wrong. Um, and you you can't you can't go around playing with these uh, hyperdimensional technologies and not have hyperdimensional consequences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the bottom line to it. Well, going forward, how would uh, if we wanted to test this as as a theory, um, mm -hmm. what would you look for going forward that that would either prove or disprove the case? Well, the first thing that you'd have to do is you'd have to set up uh, networks of people looking at data correlations. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a few people doing this on the internet in, in respect to HARP and weather and CERN and magnetosphere and so on. But you'd also have to start looking at, uh, in my opinion, the most obvious indicator of, of mass human behavior. You'd have to start looking at markets. Um, commodities markets, stock markets, uh, so on and so forth. Now the problem there is, is that already those markets are uh, as, as Catherine Fitz put it to me recently, those markets are now subject to constant intervention. Well, might that, they, be, might that be an attempt to actually hide some things, like uh, yeah. some signs of this kind of effect? It could be. It could be. Um, the other problem with these markets is, as you know, they're, they're being driven by, guess what, computer algorithms. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and again, that might be an indicator, as you say, that they're trying to hide certain things. But... Nonetheless, I think you could make a case that certain types of behavior could be looked at, certain pur uh, purchases and so on could be looked at, uh, outbreaks or incidences of violence or lack thereof coordinated to some of this activity. Gradually, over time, if you were able to coordinate all of this, uh, gradually over time you would either be building up a pattern of confirmation or you know a pattern of ram randomness and no confirmation um, there have been people as I say that are doing this in kind of certain selected areas but not nearly on the scale that, that I'm suggesting might be the case here with Mandela effect and, and CERN and, and the surveillance programs I wonder if anybody has collated the, the Princeton eggs with, with CERN and, and other, <laughs> other effects like that. I don't know. That's an excellent question because, you know, the, the Princeton eggs did have their, their uh, precursor event prior to 9-11. Yes. And massive. that's very, yeah, massive. And that's very interesting to me because you can, uh, if you, if you read, in the parapsychology literature deeply, 
there was a Swedish psychologist back, I think, in the 50s or 60s that was noticing a similar thing that that his his uh, people that he was experimenting with would often have some sort of precursor signal to something that would actually be asked or happen later in the course of, of the experiments. So it, it would appear that one of these hyperdimensional effects is that something uh, is flowing backward in time. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, which completely upsets the apple cart <laughs> when you stop and think about it in terms of causation. Well, so, that's, that's certainly one of the problems with, with uh, remote viewing and uh, a number of other okay. things where, uh, especially remote viewing the future, I mean, you're, you're, you're literally speculating that, that information is flowing backwards in time. Right, exactly, exactly. And, you know, with, with the Princeton eggs and this uh, Swedish psychologist, yeah, I wish I could remember his name, uh, yeah, you, you're getting clear experimental indication that this is, in fact, the case. So, again, you know, if you were, if you were doing these data correlation experiments, how would you, what would you look for? And I w I'm with you. I would think one of the first things you'd be looking for are effects on random number generators like, like the Princeton eggs. Like the Princeton eggs. That, that would be really interesting to look at. I, I haven't thought of that until this moment. So. Well, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think this is, uh, this is something that needs to be looked at. And again, you know, it's, it's, it's really a case of uh, the data that they're releasing. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I'm kind of amazed to this day, Bernard, that they even released the, the Princeton egg data on 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a clear hit. Yeah. Uh, that this is not a random thing. Um, so, yeah, all of this, I think, is deeply, deeply connected. We're just, we're just to, you know, to boil it all down, we're just on the cusp, really, of looking at consciousness as not the minor player that, that materialistic science has made it out to be, but the actual driving factor of, of so much. And uh, we're just on the cusp of trying to figure out, you know, the scientific uh, laws by which this effect really is there and right. what it's capable of doing. Yeah, which, well, uh, you know, if you go back to uh, Buddha, you know, he... 2,500 years ago was saying that consciousness is basically reality itself. Right, right. And again, if you want to keep, you know, this goes to my my uh, epistemological war, warfare hypothesis, if you want to keep people from exercising a group consciousness effect, what do you do? Well, you divide. In other words, you make any potential group incoherent. In other words, uh, they, can, they cannot agree upon a formally specified intention. Uh, truly divide and conquer. Yeah, truly divide and conquer. Uh, keep the keep the data stream obfuscated to the point that no consensus of intention can be built. Wow. And of course, the the response to that is simply ignore them and and go ahead with your group conscious, you know, spelled out intention anyway. <laughs> wow. That's just it's just mind boggling. That's. You know, we, we started talking about the Mandela effect and have gotten into the universe as we know it. So, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because this is what I think the Mandela effect is really pointing to. Wow. You know, it's it's interesting that we both come from liturgical traditions in in Christianity, where you had where you had specific uh, group prayers that were appointed for you know certain times of the day, oh, yeah. uh, cer certain times of the year. And as those things themselves have either been gutted, you know, through processes of quote unquote liturgical reform or what have you, mm -hmm. or people simply no longer pay attention to them, the chaos has increased. And, uh, you know, uh, this takes me back to what I've said. If, if you, if you want to, uh, create incoherence in any potential group, consciousness effort, this is the way you do it. You you change the data stream. You would you would mangle the the uh, timelines, the historical memory and so on. Uh -huh. uh, and you know, the churches have been big victims of mangling the historical timeline in a major way. Oh yeah. So 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, to me, it looks like this whole thing is, is part of some grand social engineering experiment, and the way, again, the way to fight it is ignore it. <laughs> just, let's just go right ahead with... with well, the, and even on a personal level, people tend to ignore things that, that just fall way outside their their everyday experience. They're, they're, they just aren't willing to deal with it. Right. Right. And and I think to a certain extent, probably whoever is doing this is is depending on that fact. Oh yes, absolutely. I would agree wholeheartedly there. Mm. Absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. So, wow. Well, anyway, <laughs> I, I mean, we've 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 shot through an entire hour and have just barely scratched the surface on this thing. But uh, you know, maybe we can pick this up at a later time when there's some more information to talk about. Certainly. Uh, but uh, to wrap up, why don't you, uh, what, what have you got going that uh, you'd like to uh, let us know about? Uh, well, there's nothing really that I've got going. I just had a book uh, come out about a month ago called Hess and the Penguins, um, <laughs> all, all about the Rudolph Hess case. A very, very strange case it is. Yes. Uh, and, and incidentally, one dealing directly with some of, the, some of these consciousness things that we've been talking about, believe oh, it or man. not. Yeah, it's it, you know I when I encountered that piece of information uh, when I was researching the book Bernard, I was sitting in my living room reading uh, some other researchers that had done just a beautiful job with with the Hess case, and they mentioned this bit of information that I you know I just said out loud to the living room, "You've got to be kidding me!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that happens to me quite a bit as, anymore at any rate. <laughs> So yeah, that book just came out. Um, I'm, I'm involved with trying to, to uh, research another book that's kind of very generally related to some of the topics we talked about tonight. But uh, other than that, you know, life goes on. It's fairly quiet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's quiet is good sometimes. Quiet uh, is very good. <laughs> I, I'd like to, to note also that your your website is GizaDeathStar.com.